Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-big law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about being smart about your career goals. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together with the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we have ex-big law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about being smart about your career goals. Welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. Well, we were talking about this beforehand, and, you know, we get a lot of questions on this topic. So what are we really talking about here? Well, I think it's just important to be realistic about, you know, what jobs you can get now and sort of what your long term career goals are and how you can get there and sort of when you can get there. Right. Because, I mean, I think sometimes people think, oh, I can just apply for anything and they get really fixated on a certain type of job. But why is it bad to aim too high? I mean, shouldn't we just be aiming for whatever we want? Well, I think of it more as kind of how you're spending your time. So if you really do have the time to submit a million applications for anything that might, you know, stick, then I guess you could spend your time on that. But I just don't think that's probably the best use of your time. And you're probably busy with school stuff, too. So I feel like it's a good idea uh, to sort of Be realistic and you can apply for some places that might sort of seem like a reach. I just don't think it's a good idea to spend most of your time on that if it's like not likely that you sort of meet their qualifications. And so it'd be better to do, you know, applications in places that you sort of more have a chance at now and then you can work towards your long term goals later. Right. I mean, I think of it almost like applying to law school, like certain reach goals are fine. You know, go ahead and throw in a few applications to places that maybe you're a little underqualified for, but you'd love to work at. But you also need to cover your target and your safety goals because you don't want to end up at the end of this process with nothing. Um, You know, that's definitely not a great place to find yourself in. So I think it's just, as you said, important to be realistic while also, you know, being hopeful, but not totally focusing on that. Exactly. That's exactly how I see it. And, you know, I think you just need to kind of focus on how you're going to get to your goal and not necessarily when you're going to get to your goal. And also just because you want something and you want a certain job does not mean that you're necessarily going to get that certain job. So, you know, <laughs> very true. being more flexible. I think some people really get things stuck in their head. This is what I want. Um, and so you just, you know, don't always get it. Right. I mean, you know, it's like that Rolling Stones song might yep. just get what you need, not what you want. Um, yeah. So, you know, nobody, nobody is entitled to a certain job. Nobody's guaranteed a certain job. It doesn't matter what school you go to or how you did there. So I agree. Flexibility is probably the best way forward, particularly when we're in like a weird economy, which I think we're kind of in a weird economy right now. Um, Well, let's talk about big law, since this is the one people most often, I feel, have unrealistic ideas about. So just give us the basics. I mean, if anyone's listening to this, they don't really quite understand how this works. How do people get, generally get, entry-level big law jobs? So most people are getting big law jobs through OCI and a really traditional process that, you know, is designed a certain way and you go through it a certain way and they come to your school or now it's virtual, uh, but they're coming to find students at your school who meet their criteria and then you're coming as a summer associate and then you're getting an offer at the end of the summer to come back after you graduate as a full-time associate And that's sort of the traditional path. Um, And remember, they're coming to your school for OCI because they want students from that school. And so they're kind of actively trying to recruit those people. Uh, And so that would sort of be the way that most people are getting their big law jobs. Right. And 
you know, someone's listening to this and like, well, that sucks because my school doesn't have OCI or they don't have, you know, the option I want at OCI. Is this literally the only way in or are there other options either entry level or later on? So it's definitely not the only way in. Um, And you can still apply to firms that aren't, you know, coming to your school for OCI. Um, Or if your school doesn't have an OCI, I think you just need to be realistic that those um, hiring criteria are going to be even greater because they're not coming to your school. So they weren't actively trying to find someone from your school. Um, So I wouldn't say you can't apply. You just need to be realistic. Then it's less likely. Um, And there are firms that hire three L's. So that would be an entry level job. Like you weren't there as a summer associate, you had a different job during the summer. um, And they may be hiring entry level. Um, And we've talked about three L hiring more uh, in other episodes, but that's also less common. And again, um, you know, the bar is going to be high for that. And then later on, I think it's kind of more possible to maybe get into a smaller firm or another type of job and then move to big law is definitely possible depending on sort of what your practice area is, what your experience is, and the criteria sort of change for that person who's then a lateral associate. Right. Right. So, yeah, I think I know a number of people who didn't start in big law, but that was their longer term career goal. We'll talk about this later on as well in more detail. But it's certainly possible, you know, outside of that kind of entry level hiring to get in. Um, But if you want that first job out of school in big law, the reality is, you know, OCI is by and large the way that you're going to get it. Although certainly you can apply So what are these firms looking for, whether it's like OCI, you just send them your resume and ask them, you know, you you want to be a summer. What what are their criteria? So I would say that really grades are the most important criteria. And I know that maybe not what people want to hear um, and that they're being looked at more, you know, in a well-rounded way, but that's just not true. So they are going to look at your grades first and they may have like a set you know, cut off. I would, wouldn't get too stuck on like whatever it said though, in like the materials you received where they have to write a grade cut off a lot of times. And so if you're close to that, that's when I think like you can still go for it. If they're cut off, they say is a three, five and you have a two, six, like that's not happening. There's (laughs) just like, that's just not happening. (laughs) If you have a two, six, you're not getting into big law probably anywhere. And so I think you need to be realistic about that. They also, they're looking at what school you're at. So that's important too. And that's why they're deciding where they're doing OCI uh, you know, which schools are going to. And generally, those are the only schools they're looking for students from, and they actually care about that. So maybe they want students from a school that they haven't gotten someone from in the past, or it's just a top school, or it's, you know, the school that their hiring partner went to. There's lots of reasons that people like add and subtract schools, but that's also really important, um, which doesn't mean that you can't be a write in from another school and they may hire you, but it's just, again, less likely. And then aside from that, you know, they are looking at things we've talked about before, like law review and moot court and activities you've done. They also are looking for diversity. They may be looking for, you know, that you're active as a leader on campus. Um, You know, they're not really looking at like how you did in undergrad, but maybe they will sort of look at like, have you excelled um, academically before? Have you worked? Do you have work experience? What is it? Um, That kind of thing. Yeah, so I think all these other factors come into play, I think, around the margins. Um, But the reality is they're basically looking at grades in school. Um, You know, I've been at different firms. I've interviewed places. You've obviously been at different firms. You've run the hiring. You know, they do have these matrices. And some firms take them more seriously than others of, you know, we're looking for a 3-7 out of, like, whatever school this is. We're looking for a 3-6 out of this school. Um, And, you know, if that's not kind of close to where you're at, I think you've got to be realistic about that. Exactly. And I know that close can be, you know, a range, but I do think it's like, you know, within like 0.1 or 0.2 of what we're talking about. Yeah. So I mean, it if they're can't asking be for, huge. Yeah. If they want like a 3.7, 
you know, you have a three, six, like, okay, you know, you've got some other things going for you that can probably work. I mean, even in getting into like a three, five, someone's probably going to say no to that. I mean, again, it depends on the firm. Some firms are more flexible. Um, but you know, I definitely worked a place where they're like, if someone does not meet our grade criteria, do not send them for a follow-up interview. Done. Right. Because then you're just wasting people's time because there's no way they'll get through the final process. And that's like actually respecting the student also, like they shouldn't spend time you know, to have you in if there's no way they can make you an offer. Yeah, I mean, I think it frustrated some of the people who are doing the on-campus interviews because it was sort of like, well, why do we even bother going if we're just going to use their transcript? Couldn't we just cut this out? Um, Actually, that firm later did cut out OCI. (laughs) But, but, you know, I mean, I think for most people who bother sending interviewers, there is a little bit of give and take. Um, But, you know, you have to kind of really blow someone out of the water and, you know, they might get one person they can kind of go to bat for. But again, like you said, it's not going to be a two six like that's not happening. Exactly. And it can be hard. There are schools that aren't really doing grades anymore, although usually there's some way to distinguish people, you know, the places where it's like high honors, honors, pass. There is still a way to see that you did better you know so it really there's nowhere where we can't see anything about how you did in school and that's always going to be the most important factor right i mean i think we technically weren't allowed to calculate a gpa and we definitely were not allowed to put it on anything but they had your transcript i mean (laughs) it's like if you're on law review and they've got your transcript and it's showing like you know pretty good grades they can do that gpa if they want to nobody's stopping them So I guess what I would say also is like, if you're in that situation and you want to get there, spending a ton of time on applying to all these big law firms and, you know, that kind of thing, that's not a good use of your time. You should be working on getting your grades up, Right. you know, that should be, your focus should always be the academics because again, that's going to lead to the jobs. Right. And I think that's one thing people can do, you know, if maybe the first year didn't go, you know, it went okay, but it wasn't really like knocking it out of the park level that wasn't like guaranteeing you a big law job type of situation. I think that is a case where you might get lucky with 3L hiring if you have like a really big increase in grades your second year, um, because then you've got a stronger story. And if they are, you know, 3L hiring is hard because they're not necessarily looking for people. But if someone is looking for people, you're going to be probably towards the top of their list because you can show like, you know, a really good increase your second year. Then like, okay, cool. Like your grades are now in the range we're looking for. I agree completely. And showing a really big improvement says something as well, just like that you figured out how to do it, you know, and maybe you sought help and you got resources. You picked some better classes. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But I mean, you kind of can make your story work. Oh, yeah. My second year was definitely my best because I took a clinic. That was an easy A, you know, <laughs> just like well, that's that's a lot good. of credits. Yeah. Make some decisions, you know, that are kind of strategic if you're going to be at a job where grades are going to be super important. Yeah. No, I definitely did. I mean, I kind of looked at my schedule and was like, hmm, maybe I'll put a couple of these harder classes with, you know, typically lower grades off until my third year since I'm busy doing law review and I have this clinic and like, hmm, you know, that ended up working out pretty well because I took more paper classes. I'm you know, good at writing papers with less pressure. So I think you can definitely shape your 2L year to improve your grades if you want to. And again, that should be your focus, like focusing on a ton of time on, you know, the job stuff is not a good idea if there's something you can do about the academics. Right. I agree with that. Um, All right. Well, say someone's accepted. All right. Even though I want to maybe do this, big law is probably not realistic for right now. How can someone kind of set themselves up on a career path to possibly do this later? So one path that I always suggest to people is clerkships, um, which again, are hard to get (laughs) and grades are going to matter and all that stuff. But, you know, there are, you know, ways to potentially get clerkships um, and making the right connections. And some judges like to hire from certain schools. So that's a possibility. And the clerkship route is sort of an alternate route to big law. And I feel like you're sort of judged differently and it's coveted. And, um, you know, it's it's a, sort of just a different path than OCI. So I think that's something to always consider and figure out if there's a way to get a clerkship. Yeah, I think that's kind of the classic one. I mean, I had a friend who managed to actually do this quite successfully 
who went to a school that was sort of less known because they gave her a lot of scholarship money, which she needed for various reasons. And then when she got out, she wanted to come to the Bay Area and do like a very specific type of work. And, you know, the Bay Area is very competitive. They were not really willing to hire this person, even though she'd done very well from the school they didn't really know. They never hired from before. You know, and it was really frustrating for her because she's like, I'm equally good to all these other people, probably better because I've had to struggle more to get where I am. Um, but, you know, she made it work. She basically like took a different job at a smaller place for a while and kind of shifted around and eventually did some contract work in big law and then eventually got hired at a firm and was actually very successful. There was nothing that should have prevented her from doing that from the start, but it took, you know, probably four or five years to actually make that happen in the end. I think that's a great strategy and like it's not going to work for everyone and like you said it's sort of a longer term strategy so she had to kind of stick with it but I do think it's like an excellent route to get in and clerkships are just really um, looked at highly in big law and I don't think all law students really know that that just having that is a big deal right it's a big deal that kind of follows you around forever um, you also get a nice payout, um, like a bonus when you mm-hmm. start at the firm from the cl- clerkship. And I don't know that all law students know that. And it depends and it's changed over time. And, and not every firm pays the exact same amount, but it is quite a nice. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, it's always been a lot. <laughs> I remember getting that check. I was like, sweet. <laughs> yeah. And it's right. It's right when you start. Yeah. It was great. I remember the day I got that check. Um, Yeah. And another thing people can do, you know, is maybe you start out at a smaller place that's not your ideal and then you clerk because then you actually get paid more as a clerk. And then you use that to kind of leverage into like a different bigger firm or something. I think that can work really well. Um, You know, I think people go a lot from government jobs into firms later, which I'm not sure people really kind of get. You know, if you have experience at a certain type of government work. I mean, we can argue on policy grounds whether this is good public policy, but a lot of people do move from government into firms to sort of, you know, particularly regulatory type of stuff. So that's also a path. I mean, I think it just depends on what people want to do. Or like the DA's office or the Mm -hmm. public defender's office, Um, like the, you know, white collar team is always going to be interested in those people, stuff like that. Um, those positions are also coveted, right? So they're not easy to get either. <laughs> right. Like, and I think these are people easy. don't always know that. <laughs> yeah. Like they think that's the backup plan and it's like, no, there's definitely like top law students trying to get those jobs too, because they want to be in public interest, but those are definitely a great way in. I think get you, you know, good experience. I think that's probably actually a better route than like a random law firm, especially like a really small law firm. I think that can be sort of a harder route. If you're going though somewhere that's more like boutique and has a particular practice group that you're gonna get experience in and then move to that practice group at big law, I think that's another route, like pick a specialty where you're gonna get really solid experience and kind of sell yourself as somebody who's you know learned a lot quickly. Right. I think it has to be something pretty specific too. you know, just going in and being like, oh, I'm doing random litigation work at some random firm. It's probably not ultimately going to position you to do, you know, litigation work in big law because that's just not really where they're coming from. Um, I was thinking like employment law would be a good area where like kind of a smaller. Yeah, exactly. Or IP. There's there's a few different areas I think you know, would be good. Um, But you, again, need to be really strategic and stick with your plan. Well, I mean, ideally, it would also be an area of law that you actually find interesting. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) You know what I mean? If you're listening to this, you're like, oh, I'm going to go to employment law because you told me that was going to get me in big law in five years. It's like, that's not really what we're saying. You've got to be like top of the top of like wherever you are. Um, Definitely. And I think you're right that liking it and enjoying what you do is probably going to make you more successful at it also. But I would focus on getting as good experience as you can during that time, you know, that you're not in big law to make sure like you're really learning the skills. Right. Because I think that's really key. I mean, I think anytime you're looking to move on, and we've talked about this before, whether it's, you know, to a different type of job or just to a different, you know, firm or pathway or whatever, you know, you've got to think people are looking in terms of like the skills and experiences that you should have acquired in that time frame. So there are just certain things you're expected to do. Um, And the reality is actually you get to do a lot more of these things often 
at a smaller firm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think you can, or even, you know, I mean, I think of my law school roommate who went and became a public defender and basically on day one gets, you know, 100 cases dropped into her lap and they're like, you're doing court in 15 minutes. And she's like, what? You know, so she basically got a lot more hands-on experience, I guarantee you, than I did sitting behind my desk and like maybe occasionally like doing part of a deposition. And I think the big law firms totally know that, you know, like you've had trial experience as like a very junior associate, and that's a really big deal for them. So you should think about that, you know, that that's gonna go a long way. Yeah, I think just wherever you land, be looking for opportunities to do things, um, A, because you'll learn something from it and you'll actually improve your own skills, but also because other people that are looking to hire you later want to know, like, what can you actually do? Um, And, you know, the reality is I think a lot of people who start as associates in big law kind of struggle with this because they get to the end of three to four years and they're looking for other jobs and people are like, well, what have you done? Like, (laughs) <laughs> like and there yeah. is, there's often not like a really clear answer because what you do is sort of amorphous you're not like oh you know i've been running a trial team or i've done 15 you know cases to a jury on my own which is totally realistic in a few years i think at a lot of places well and we've talked about how you can potentially get that experience doing pro bono work which i think is sort of a similar concept right like right you have a more chance to like jump into things so you're not doing that full time Right, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Don't tell them that that's what you want. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. All right, well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about other jobs sort of coming out of law school. Um, If you want to do something in public interest or government, what do you think is important um, kind of in law school at that entry level point? And I know we just said, like, these jobs can actually be really competitive. Yeah, I was going to say, so grades matter here, too. (laughs) And I think, yeah, Um, you know, it depends on the job, you know, and how exciting it is to people. Um, And obviously, these jobs pay less, you know, so there's that. Although I will say that some of these jobs do pay quite well in like big markets, Mm -hmm. which people are surprised about. That's another reason that they're sort of coveted. Um, So they are still looking at your grades, the school you went to. Um, I think in these jobs, they're looking for like more of a commitment to that area, you know, so like you've done public interest work before um, and it's on your resume, like they don't want it to be the launching off point for your career in big law either. Right. (laughs) So they want you to want to do that. Yeah, you need, I think there, everything you've talked about matters, but then also it matters a lot what you've been doing in law school during the summers, during externships, um, you know, maybe in some type of clinic, and also your relationships. So those jobs are much more relationship based of, you know, somebody's probably going to call up someone they know and say, oh, you've worked with this person, what do you think of them? Um, It's just a little more personal, I think. Definitely. And I think you want to kind of sell your commitment to it, that you care about it, that this is, you know, the career you want, that kind of thing. Right. I think you have to show that, too. You can't just, you know, you basically can't. Sometimes I think people, you know, they take like whatever random job they get first year summer and then they go and they are summer associate and then they think they're going to go work for the ACLU. And it's like, that's probably not really what they're looking for, actually. Exactly. <laughs> I agree completely. You know, it's like you don't get to just sort of like up and decide you're going to do that. You need to tell that story through your classes and things. Um, so, I mean, as with anything, I think the more of a plan you have, probably the better it's going to work out. I mean, I always think of someone I knew in law school who knew coming in she wanted to be a federal public defender, which is a very specific type of role. And there aren't that many of them. Um, and then that's what she does now because she spent her entire law school experience basically building her resume to the point at which she was the perfect candidate for that job. So not surprisingly, she got hired. Yeah. And most people I know in those situations are exactly the same. I would say if you sort of realize halfway through that you're going this route or you're trying to go this route, then you want to put together a story as best you can, you know, at that point to tell that. And I think it's still possible. It's just that you want it to all make sense and not look like, oh, I just switched gears because I wasn't going to be able to do the thing I really wanted to do. Right. And then you can edit your resume strategically as well on that. Um, How realistic do you think it is to go in-house right out of law school? You know, historically i'd say not very um like that was sort of always 
the way it was. But I do think it's more common now that there are more of these entry level jobs. Um, and, you know, with tech being so big right now, I think there are more opportunities. Uh, it's sort of, you know, a different path. And, you know, I'm not saying that, like, just because that's what you want to do, you're going to get it. Again, you need to, like, set yourself up for that and tell that story. But I know they're hiring more summer associates. So that's definitely, again, the way to go with that. And I think it is a possibility but you need to, you know, show that that's the route you're going to take. I agree. I think it used to be just sort of like, yeah, that doesn't happen. But I think now it is becoming more common as businesses build out their in-house legal teams more. I definitely have heard, at least anecdotally, a lot more stories about people going in-house straight out of school and things like that. So I think it's worth researching. Um, but I probably would not you know, I wouldn't go to law school and start thinking that was the only thing I wanted to do when I got out because I still don't think it's that common. I'd also be concerned about the training because most of these teams are, it's going to be a lot smaller. And, you know, if they're not used to having like a legal team, they may not know how to train an entry level person. So maybe you'll get thrown into it and you'll learn a lot that way. But you also may miss out on some of the things you'd get at a firm or even a government job or something like that. So I think about that also. Well, and I think traditionally the teams of lawyers in-house have done different types of work than mm -hmm. the work. So if people aren't familiar, oftentimes they'll have like in-house team that kind of handles the day-to-day. -day. You know, they're drafting the contracts for the new hires and maybe doing some HR stuff. Although even then anything complicated for HR, they would probably have a firm that they talk to that does it. Um, and, you know, if it's like a complicated case, they're probably farming it out to their outside counsel. So it's just a different type of work. It's not better or worse, but I think it's worth understanding what you're getting into. I agree completely. Um, all right. Well, before we wrap up, do you have any ideas for someone who wants to kind of map out a longer term plan, maybe say five years or so? What should these person like? How can you do that? You're like, okay, I realize like, you know, I'm probably not going to be able to do this thing I want to do immediately but I want to work my way into it. How do I figure out that path? So I think it's advice I give to law students about, you know, a lot of this type of thing, which is it's great to find people who have the career path you're interested in and talk to them about how they got there. Um, and it could be people that you have a personal relationship with, or it could be sort of cold call emailing based on, you know, looking at at people's bios and maybe it's through your linkedin or um or maybe it's at a specific place and you've looked up you know the bios of different people but i would reach out proactively and try to talk to them and tell them that you're interested in this area and you want to hear more about their career path so i think that's great and then maybe you can find some sort of mentors that way or people you can stay in touch with um and not necessarily that they're going to find you a job but you can you can actually ask them questions about how they got there and ask for their advice and and take it <laughs> like actually do what they say um <laughs> so i think that's a great idea and sort of looking at your own network and making sure that you're sort of you know your linkedin's always updated you're keeping up with things you're you know reading and being current about like topics and the areas you're interested in being involved in like the bar associations and they have particularly like sort of junior lawyer areas um so basically my advice is to get involved and be proactive and network which i always tell people to do um and so like you really need to take ownership and make sure that you're always like moving yourself forward towards the goal. And I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the skill development. You know, you want to be evaluating at different points along this plan. Like, okay, I'm two years in. Like, is this where I thought I was going to be? Am I getting the experiences I wanted to get? Like, do I have enough skills that maybe I can start shifting someplace else? Um, you know, I think you just want to be constantly evaluating how this is going and are you moving closer or maybe your goals have changed you know maybe you realize i'm talking to your friends who are law firm associates like you don't actually want to do this and that's also completely fine absolutely i also think it's great if you know someone in big law to find out if that place has like a 
a document that has like their benchmarks or things they're supposed to have hit at certain points so you can find out specifically if you're getting the right skills Um, because everyone kind of has that. That's true. Yeah, they all have that these days. All right. Well, we're pretty much out of time. Any final thoughts on this? Kind of what you just said, which is that I think some people have a goal in mind or they've always heard big law is the thing or being a partner or, you know, being a general counsel or whatever it is. And so make sure that you're not just pushing yourself towards it because that's what you'd always done or thought you were going to do. And just make sure you're reevaluating, um, you know, what it is that would make you happy and keep you engaged and, you know, is a good idea versus just like, you know, what you kept like going towards because maybe there's also a reason that you didn't you know qualify for it or was it maybe it wasn't the right path for you so you know it's great to have a goal and if that's what you want go for it but just make sure that you're continuing to reevaluate like what you want what would make you happy I think that's true. I think as people's lives change, also your you know, work life desires may change. And yeah, you know, sometimes you do see people who just get fixated on this idea. And at some point, it's just like, this is probably not leading you towards greater happiness. Maybe you should just drop this and like appreciate what you have. Absolutely. All right. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. For more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one with us, you can check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.